I'm Mark Spossler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, April 4th. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, real data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean, we have, I wouldn't even call it a gale, a low pressure system off of central California producing 19 foot seas aimed at the Hawaiian Islands, but not back at the U.S. West Coast at all. And other than that, a pretty quiet pattern across the North Pacific. More interesting things are going on in the South Pacific, but we're not quite ready to do the transition fully over to the South Pacific yet, but we're awfully close. As usual, we'll start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when gales form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a dip in the jet, and we don't see one anywhere except here coming off the U.S. West Coast. So the northern branch of the jet pushes off of Japan. Right here, it instantly splits. The southern branch dives down towards the equator. The northern branch travels up the Kurile Islands, over the Aleutians, the whole way into Alaska, and then the last second makes this sort of, sort of bat, what we'll call a backdoor trough right here. What that helps to do is create a counterclockwise flow aloft and down at the ocean surface. That's the hallmark of low pressure. And low pressure, if it's deep enough or strong enough, generates winds. Winds, if they're strong enough, generate seas. Seas, if they're strong enough, uh, uh, as they radiate away from the fetch area, turn into swell, and swell when it hits your beach turns into surf. So we have a weak little trough off the U.S. West Coast, and other than that, we have a massively split jet stream, and typically in between the split flows, you get nothing but high pressure, and that's pretty much what's happening. We'll put this into motion. As we get into Monday, the trough, or the backdoor trough, whatever you want to call it, completely collapses. Now, but then, oh, look at this, a little bit of energy Looks like it's going to try to reorganize there, but there's really nothing suggesting that any swell would be generated from that. But look at that. It persists even as we get into Friday. But other than that, the jet still pretty much just non-supportive of anything that would look like a gale till, well, actually, let's see. I thought somewhere here. Let's go back. Right there we go. On Thursday, I got a little ahead of myself. On Thursday, the northern branch does dip to the south just a little bit. And there you go. You could possibly get a little, that's a trough, a little bit of low pressure forming there. This is on Thursday night, Friday morning. But by Saturday, that trough is gone. And then the other little interesting thing is going maybe a week out, the jet stream appears to consolidate. Now, there's no real trough indicated, and the split, the jet is no longer split either. The split point then turns north of Hawaii and is right here. So maybe there's some hope, but given that it's mid-April, the odds of any significant storm developing are probably pretty low, but we'll keep our eyes on it just the same. Next up, we'll take a look at surface level pressure, surface level winds for the next week. Here's this little low pressure system. What is that about a... 1,008 millibar low, which is not much of a low pressure system at all. Real, what's really going on is you have a 1040 millibar high pressure system, very strong high pressure. And let's be clear, high pressure has been stronger than normal over the North Pacific Basin this entire winter, but especially as we get into spring, all that driven by La Nina. That high pressure in close, close proximity to the low pressure creates what's known as a pressure gradient tightens up the ice bars between the two and you get wind and there's that 30 to 35 knot wind that's generating seas there in that area. As we get into Monday, you see that fetch completely collapse, 1040 millibar high, just dominating the bulk of the North Pacific. Some sort of fetch actually hanging here now, 30 knot winds on Tuesday and then fading. Here's another low that's forecast pushed off Japan. This just showed up on the models on Wednesday into Thursday, lifting pretty far to the north. We'll take a look at that. Maybe there's some hope from the islands from that. And then come, as we get into Friday, a new fetch. We know that there's a trough forming in this area. 
45 knot winds over a tiny area and 30 to 35 knot over a larger area aimed southeast. Maybe getting some traction on the ocean surface and then fading out by Saturday morning. Maybe that's good for some uh, swell, maybe more like wind swell pushing into California. And then looking out, where are we? We're almost out. Of, there we are. Uh, a week from now, nothing really going on. And again, here we go. Significant wave heights. This from the GFS version 16 model. No longer can we call it the NOAA Wave Watch wave model. It's been ingested into the GFS weather model. They're all the same, running at a much higher resolution, like, oh, I don't remember, six times or nine times higher resolution than what it used to run at, which is good things. That will make it more accurate. Anyway, 19 foot seas, 19.4 foot over a tiny little area right here, pretty much aimed solely at Hawaii. That fades out as we get into Monday. We know there's still to be some fetch there. 16 foot seas as we get into Tuesday and fading from there. The net effect is some sort of We'll call it northeast angled wind swell, maybe 11 second period swell pushing into the islands, I think starting on Tuesday, Wednesday into Thursday, something like that. Uh, now this is new here, just most recent run, uh, 28 foot seas forecast off of northern Japan as we get into Wednesday night and Thursday, but not getting any real eastward momentum to it, so... Maybe some tiny swell for Hawaii, but not expecting much. And then also as we get into Friday, fetch development in the northern Gulf of Alaska. What is that? 24 foot seas. Yeah, 23, 24 foot seas for a short little window on Friday night. So maybe some swell. You can actually see it pushing down the coast, maybe into California on Sunday. That would be ex very north angle, only the most exposed break. And there's probably going to be a bunch of local wind swell hitting at the same time. So... You know, probably nothing to get too excited about, and that is it. Let's go take a look down south. So we're looking back a week in time, and there was a gale in the far southeast Pacific, 35-foot seas right here. Uh, actually, it was aimed a little bit better to the uh, northeast earlier. Swell from this system is hitting California now. It started yesterday, and there was previous swell in the water that. I mean, it's actually been a pretty good run of not large, but modest-sized southern hemi swell. Top spots today. Yesterday, even, we're in the head high, maybe a foot overhead on the peak at the, you know, where you get the best, uh, um, bathymetry and, and whatnot. Um, and the today, pretty much the same in the about one foot overhead range, top spots, and pretty consistent and pretty solid indeed. That system faded out and was gone. And so then there was this other little system. We're not even going to, because it only had, what, 23 foot seas on Monday. But there's a little bit of maybe a micro swell forecast behind uh, the swell that's hitting right now. I mean, that, that swell should fade out on uh, Monday, Tuesday, uh, probably Tuesday sort of time frame. Maybe a little pulse behind that. And then then after that, things got pretty quiet. And then starting today, a new gale started developing under New Zealand. 30-foot seas, nothing particularly interesting. Building to 35 feet this evening, uh, all aimed due east, not off to the northeast. And then the gale sort of falling further southeast, but building more with seas forecast to 42 feet as we get into Monday evening, holding in that range, and then falling southeast from there. Let's go through this whole thing. You see it starts here and ends up down here so that's that tra trajectory the exact opposite of what we, want. What we really want to see it is pushing off to the northeast but nonetheless small swell is expected to result assuming all this goes as planned for hawaii and the u.s west coast but the reality is size pretty small looking out beyond that as we get into wednesday thursday Tiny gale forecast, 30-foot seas, again aimed off to the east. Pretty good system pushing into Tasmania, but now we're almost a week out. Nothing really 
Oh, this is a little bit new here. Another small system on the very east edge of the Southern California swell window a week out. Don't know if I'd believe that for a nanosecond, just any model more than three or four days out. Not such a believable scenario, but we'll see. Maybe the new GFS model will, will get a better track record than the old one. Anyway, so nothing significant really forecast for the South Pacific. Also notice ice getting a little bit broader foothold now over the southern hemi as we move into closer to the winter season down there. Quick look for wind swell for California and Hawaii. Low pressure here, pretty much cutting the legs out of high. There's the high pressure right there. Trades, yeah, northeast 15 knots, but very shallow over the Hawaiian Islands and next to nothing along the California coast. That's as of Sunday. Monday, trades, so I, I don't know if you want to call it trades, but the standard high pressure driven northeast winds along the coast, 15 knots. Again, the same sort of shallow fetch, but notice this fetch north of Hawaii aimed directly at the islands. That will be the main swell source. California kind of cut out by this low pressure system in terms of wind swell. Yeah, 15, 20 knot winds in pockets along the coast, but that's good for maybe seven second period small wind swell. Nothing particularly interesting. Same deal as we get into Wednesday. Notice this low just persisting north of Hawaii. Uh, 25 knot fetch aimed at the islands. Then, of course, you notice the, the low in the northern Gulf. But we, we've talked about that already. We're really here looking at wind swell. Maybe as we get into Friday, wind swell potential starts building for exposed breaks in north, mainly central California. And then maybe a little bit more so as we get into Sunday with winds building to 30 knots off of Cape Mendocino holding. I thought, there we go, a little tiny area, 35 knot winds as we get into late Sunday night in building. So a more unfortunate upwelling wind swell, northwest winds driven by high pressure, all driven by La Nina. That is the name of the game. We knew this six months ago. We knew it was going to be pretty bad in the spring, and it indeed is. Temperatures are not warm at exposed breaks, but that's the name of the game. All right, precip. Let's go take a look. We'll save you the pain. There is literally no precip forecast, no snow forecast to the map for the mountains. Snow levels in the Tahoe area. Where the gray is, 10,500 feet, something like that for the foreseeable future. When we were doing the forecast this morning, it actually showed a dip out here on along the 13th, 14th, but now the 18Z run of the model has just eliminated that. No hope. Pretty high snow levels. Um, whatever snow there is, it will probably melt pretty quick as we get into the next couple of weeks with no renewed snowfall forecast. So um, we'll just have to uh, make the best of what you can get. Uh, and if you're backpacking, that, that maybe is a good thing for early season. All right, moving on. Let's take a look long term. What's going on with the Madden-Julian Oscillation and, of course, the El Nino-Southern Oscillation? And, yes, things are moving in a better direction. We like to, st we like to start looking at winds on the equator. This is the East Pacific here. This is the West Pacific here. We're looking at the arrows on the chart. They show the wind direction. The longer the arrow, the stronger the speed. Okay. And it is the winds on the equator, both in the East Pacific and over here in the West Pacific, but specifically the West Pacific that we're most interested in. Okay. The active phase of the, the MJO is this periodic weather oscillation, has two phases, active and inactive. They both take, when they're over the Pacific, they travel from West to East. They significantly influence trade winds and they can, and when in the active phase, the active phase uh, imparts energy to the jet stream, which feeds the storm track, but it also can help usher or create Kelvin waves, which are either a symptom of El Nino or can help to kick off El Nino. All right, so first off, we're looking at the arrows. Wind speeds out of the east, pretty strong over the east Pacific, same over the central Pacific, pretty strong in the west Pacific, the Kelvin wave generation area. All right, but it is not the actual wind speeds. It's the difference from normal for this time of year. You see, actually, those, see the east arrows here? 
So winds are a bit stronger than normal over the East Pacific, dead neutral over the Central Pacific, and we're only looking 5 degrees north and south of the equator, and a little bit stronger over here in the, in the West Pacific, suggestive of the inactive phase of the MJO. The active phase stomps on the trades, or actually can reverse them in direction from an anomaly perspective, but the inactive phase, which acts like high pressure, does not impart energy to the jet stream, does not feed the storm track, and if anything, tends to increase winds over in this area, which would suppress the formation of Kelvin waves. Looking forward at the east west component of the wind for the next week, all right? So this is the whole planet on one chart, kind of a funky chart. The blues are east anomalies, the reds are west anomalies. We want to see west anomalies, and we want to see them in the Kelvin wave generation area, all right? So how do we read this chart? 180, right up the middle, that's the date line. The far west Pacific starts at 135 east, so right about there. And you notice, right looking at that, we got a nice little block of yellow and reds right here, west anomalies. The other end of the Kelvin wave generation area, 170 west right here, we have blues, east anomalies forecast. California's down here about 120, and Ecuador is about 80 west, so right along that line right there. So we have, in the Kelvin wave generation area, we have half west anomalies, half east anomalies. The west anomalies are the sign, typically, of the active phase of the MJO. East anomalies, the inactive phase. So you can see, looking back in time here in March, inactive phase of the MJO pretty much dominated, but now... Just in the past couple of days, you get the sense that the, the active phase is trying to wake up. West anomalies are trying to push into the Kelvin wave generation area, and by the end of the week, or the net over the next seven days, those west anomalies are supposed to get moderately strong and filling half the Kelvin wave generation area. This has not happened for over a year, and is a very good sign that perhaps La Nina is quickly coming to an end. Looking further out, we go to uh, outgoing long wave radiation forecast charts. Fancy words for cloud cover. The active phase of the MJO is like a low pressure system. Low pressure generates clouds because of upward rising air. Okay. The more clouds, then that looks like a blue here. And that is a sign of the active phase of the MJO. So not unexpectedly. Oh, and how do we read this? The equator is right there. There's South America, Central America, Hawaii. Australia, New Guinea, West Pacific, right here, Kelvin wave generation area, right here, active phase of the MJO, over it, exactly what we want to see. Five days from now, active phase continues in control, continues 10 days from now, and 15 today, uh, days from now, while the inactive phase, you can see here, building strongly in the Indian Ocean. This is exactly what we want to see, and maybe could help support storm formation and perhaps Kelvin wave generation. Of course, the other models, that was the statistic model, the dynamic model, you can see is a corrupt piece of uh, garbage right now and not particularly viewable. So we'll ignore that. But we can look at phase diagram charts right here. Okay, and fortunately, this is the uh, statistic model, this is the dynamic model, and they both are active and not corrupt. All right, so what are we looking at here? The MJO, active or inactive, moves around the equator from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the Maritime Continent to the West Pacific, East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The circle here, sort of, that this is like the the weak area of the uh, of the MJO. The further the MJO is away from the circle in the center, the stronger it is. The heavy dot is where the active phase is right now, so... In the maritime continent, moving to the West Pacific, three different tracks here or projections from the statistic model puts the active phase, we'll say in the central Pacific, fit two weeks from now, and two say very weak, one says modest. The dynamic model says the active phase is to be installing in the West Pacific at, we'll say, modest strength, which isn't bad. So, a little bit of correlation between that track there and the statistic model and this on the dynamic model gives us a little bit of hope. So next we go out looking a month and things look even better here. All right, so this is the whole planet on one chart. The blues are easterly anomalies. The, we'll call that the inactive phase indicators. The reds and yellows, westerly anomalies, the active phase indicator. Dateline runs right up the middle. Far west Pacific right here, about 135 east. Kelvin wave generation area ends here. 
California is here. Ecuador is down somewhere around here. All right, so the dotted black line here is the inactive phase of the MJO, and you notice time goes this way down the graph. So inactive phase of the MJO, all but done in the Kelvin wave generation area, maybe another two or three days worth. And then the solid contour here, basically just group all this in one big pile, is a pretty strong active phase of the MJO already starting to make its way into the Kelvin wave generation area. And this, this is just the beginning. For the entire next month, according to this model, we'll call it moderate plus strength westerly anomalies building in the Kelvin wave generation area and filling... We'll say two thirds of it about starting about a week from now and holding from then on. This is good news. This again should reduce trade winds and take warm water that we know is already over the West Pacific and start pushing it to the east. We'll get more into that in a minute. Now we take a look at the three month CFS model. Again, whole plan on one chart, but past performance is down here. The future is up here. In the past, you can see December, January. Massive easterly anomalies were on the date line. The core peak of La Nina. Uh, a little bit of a westerly wind burst here in February, and we think that has unleashed a Kelvin wave. Then back to easterly anomalies, but that we're about out of that. A pretty healthy, robust patch of westerly anomalies forecast in uh, April, the whole way into mid-May, then fading a little bit, and then maybe returning beyond that into June. Let's overlay the MJO uh, indicator here. Dotted contour is the inactive phase of the MJO. The, the future is looking up on this chart. Inactive phase of the MJO, uh, we're already past the peak of it. It's supposed to be gone and out of the Kelvin wave generation area oh, by the 12th of April, right over there. Strong, not strong, but a moderate, broad, uh, active phase of the MJO, the solid red contour here, taking root with moderate plus strength westerly anomalies, holding in the Kelvin wave generation area into May 22nd. This is a good long-lasting active phase of the MJO. This could produce a second Kelvin wave. This first active phase down here we think has already produced a Kelvin wave that is traversing the Pacific. Then we go into an inactive phase, but even at, at its worst, yes, it has easterly anomalies, but also has pockets of westerly anomalies around the edges of it and pretty short-lived. Then it looks like another some weak form of active phase forecast after that. Let's overlay the low pass filter because this really tells the story. The dotted contour here over the date line, high pressure bias in control, the exact opposite of what you would typically want. This is what makes, we talked about high pressure in the Gulf of Alaska and the North Pacific and the lack of storms this winter for the most part, except for that one little window down in here where things were out of control. Um, and now all the upwelling, strong northwest winds along the coast of California and pretty strong trades over the Hawaiian Islands. That's one, two, three, four high pressure contour lines. But notice the fourth one dies here about April 12th. The third one dies about May 2nd. The second one dies May 20th, roughly. And then the last remaining high pressure bias contour line moves out of the Kelvin wave generation area officially somewhere around, let's say, June 10th. And the low pressure bias here, which all winter has been in the Indian Ocean, and by the way, this is high pressure in the Pacific, low pressure in the Indian Ocean, that's La Nina. But notice the low pressure bias starts sneaking into the West Pacific and almost filling the Kelvin wave generation area by 1st of July, building with two contour lines. That's what's setting up the ability for West anomalies to start making progress into the Pacific because the high pressure bias is getting shunted off to the east and the low pressure bias is moving in. This would, if all this plays out as forecast, that would be the absolute death knell for La Nina and would at least return us, maybe not to El Nino, but at least more to a normal pressure pattern configuration for the Pacific Ocean. Exactly what we want to see for late in this summer and into the fall for a normal pattern setting up. All right, so let's talk about what's going on in the ocean now and down at depth. This is the Pacific Ocean. This is the West Pacific here, East Pacific, 
These are the anchor lines on the TAO buoy array. Those buoys that are strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. The X's are sensors on the anchor lines going down 200 meters, 300 meters. That's like 600 feet, 900 feet, roughly speaking. Actually, it's a little bit more than that. And what you get is you take the data from the sensors, apply a model to it. You get a profile of the warm and cold water uh, profile subsurface. And clearly see the 28 degrees centigrade isotherm line here at 176, 175, 176 east. Warm water easing east a little bit. The 24 degree isotherm, much thicker in this region. It was, it cut off here in this winter, never made it east of 140 west. Now it's flowing the whole way into Ecuador and with pretty good depth to it. But it's not just the temperatures, it's the anomalies, differences from normal. And at least according to this image, we have two degree anomalies. Now they were all warm water was all plus two degrees balled up in the West Pacific, now it is flowing off to the east and theoretically impacting the surface near the equator in the, where is that, oh, 110, so south of Mexico somewhere, pushing into Ecuador, the last remaining bit of cool anomalies from La Nina are at one degree and quickly bleeding out to the surface off of Ecuador and near uh, the Galapagos. This is a Kelvin wave, this is warm water pushing off to the east. You can see it more dramatically in this image here. Let's see if we can zoom in on that just a little bit bigger. There we go. All right, warm water. Now, two different models. This one doesn't show it impacting the surface, and it's also running a bit behind the 29th of March. Uh, we're about almost a week ahead of that. So warm water, according to this, to 105 west, Pushing from west to east, if you put this, if you saw this in motion, you see it's been steadily pushing off to the east, taking the cool water that's here in the East Pacific, squeezing it to the surface, bleeding it up to the surface, and out of the way. As this Kelvin wave moves east in the next month, it should completely eliminate all this cold water and then return the ocean to a more normal temperature pattern. Upper ocean was a sea surface anomaly. This is not temperature. It's the height of the ocean surface. This is uh, Chile, Peru, Central America, Mexico. Here's the equator. There's the dateline. Hawaiian Islands right there. Uh, hard to tell, but New Guinea right there. Philippines over there. And what you see is you see minus, and we're only interested right on the equator here. All the rest of this kind of is more just after effects, symptoms of what's going on on the equator. Uh, the best thing to say is here you see plus five, plus zero, plus zero. This was all well below normal, it means the ocean height was at normal, but it was down 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters below normal just two or three months ago. Okay, cold water at depth contracts, creates a divot on the ocean surface, warm water expands, creates a bump. And that's exactly what's happening. There's a Kelvin wave under here, warm water that we saw in the previous charts, pushing off to about a point south of Mexico, somewhere right in there. We're getting normal anomalies, neutral in this area, and that should continue off to the east over the Galapagos and into Ecuador in the coming weeks and months. And you can see it here, upper ocean heat anomalies. You can see this is the West Pacific. This is the East Pacific. Greens are, I mean, blues are below normal temperatures. The peak of La Nina in November 2020, filling the entire Pacific Basin to the dateline. Warm water all trapped in the far West Pacific, driven by abnormally strong easterly trades. That's the typical of La Nina. With peak temperatures here in the February time frame, and then boom, the trades backed off a little bit and warm water started instantly flowing off to the east. You can see it here to about 110 west, south of Mexico, let's say, today, and we expect that to continue on, wiping out the cold anomalies that were in upwelling that was in control in the East Pacific, returning it at least to a neutral pattern and maybe slightly above neutral. Now that all sounds great and fine, but looking at actual ocean surface temperatures, the blues are below normal, the yellows above, you can clearly see, okay, so Chile, Peru, the Galapagos, the equator right there, okay, Mexico, Hawaii there. You can clearly see cold water 
up well into the surface along Peru and off of Ecuador, and then along from the Galapagos out along the equator. We think what is happening here is that Kelvin wave is underneath the surface here. It's moved to about 110 west, so right around here. So there's a big pool of warm water under the surface right here, pushing this direction, taking cold water that's in front of it to under the surface and bleeding it up to the surface so you get this pattern here like this, right? But you also see warm water trying to organize around uh, uh, Central America off of Peru and Chile. So it's kind of a mixed bag. We're moving away from La Nina, but La Nina symptoms like cold water here and here are still present and down off of uh, uh, the U.S. West Coast. But there's something afoot. Things are, the pattern is trying to change. Now we're happy to report last week and for two weeks or so we had a strong, strong cooling temperatures developing along uh, Peru, off of Ecuador, and even out here along the equator. Of course, as those cold subsurface waters were being forced to the surface by the approaching Kelvin wave. Now, today, look at this. Only just a tiny little area remains, which suggests to us that, yeah, temperatures are probably cold here, but they're not getting any colder, and we're just in a steady state now. The water is, these cold waters being pushed up to the surface by the Kelvin wave are continuing to erupt, but not getting any colder. If anything, the coldest of the cold water is already, the, already up to the surface, and the majority of whatever damage is going to be done is already over. The backed off view showing us nothing different. Cold water along Peru, off of Ecuador. These two things here are being driven. High pressure in the southern hemisphere, uh, stronger than normal, creating upwelling. High pressure in the northern hemisphere, also creating upwelling here. Um, and it'll be a while till for those hot, that high pressure to break down. We've got to get warm water in this area first. And then that starts affecting the jet stream, both here in what they call the Nino 1.2 region, the area tucked up here along Peru and Ecuador and out maybe to a point south, and then uh, south of Mexico. And then the official Nino 3.4 region, really it goes from right here, 5 degrees north and south of the equator from 120 west out to about 170 west. Still colder than normal temperatures there, but with the approaching Kelvin wave, once it impacts Ecuador and starts upwelling to the surface, we should see water temperatures warming significantly. Here, those warmer waters will get carried by the trades out into here, wiping all the, out all that blue and turning that back to normal. And then eventually, once that happens, the atmosphere will respond, wake up and go, hey, the ocean's warming up. And the, the strong high pressure systems that are driving all this will start to fade away. We think that won't be till the fall at the earliest, probably more around the Thanksgiving time frame. Sea surface temperatures in the Nino 1.2 region, that area right up there along uh, uh, Ecuador and Peru, still dropping, but we think they've about bottomed out at almost one degree below normal, 0.965 below normal, clearly back in La Nina territory. You see, we had warmed up a little bit. We're dropping back down. This area is pretty noisy. We're probably bottomed out here, and we should start seeing temperatures to rise slowly. In the official El Nino region, the Nino 3.4 uh, region, temperatures pretty stable. Beyond, so half a degree below normal, that's the La Nina threshold. We're at 0.36 below normal, 36 hundredths of a degree below normal. Not too bad. Not quite normal. We're not above normal, but we're not at least for the moment, in the La Nina range anymore. All right, what's going on on the atmosphere above the ocean? We know we have cold water in the ocean, but we know we're almost at the end of it. Does the atmosphere sense that something is going on? We look at the difference in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin, Australia. Tahiti in the Pacific, Darwin in the Indian Ocean, more or less. When pressure is lower in Tahiti, the index goes negative. Right, and you can see it's been a little bit of negative here and there. The daily value today, 4.47. This is all a very noisy number. It's the 30-day average. That takes the noise out of it. And we're at minus 0 0.02, dead neutral. Neither El Nino nor La Nina, neither the active phase nor the inactive phase. And looking back, you can see, hey, wait, we've been in negative territory for, I don't know, I think it was 14 or 16 days, something like that. That's a good 
good bit of data, and we were up at positive 7.57, suggesting the inactive phase of the MJO for quite a while, maybe a sense of returning to normal. And the 90-day average, certainly a lagging indicator, but it's still positive 7.65. But look at that. It's steadily dropping from, I think it was up to 15 at one point back in maybe February, something like that. We've cut that in half and we're continuing to fall. And as the 30-day average continues to fall, and we expect it will, certainly with the approaching Kelvin wave, and as that starts bleeding to the surface, you get more evaporation, more cloud cover, and then all this whole picture changes from a La Nina picture, hopefully back to a more neutral picture. And here's the 30-day moving SOI graphed out. You can see how back in 2019, we were in like bare minimal El Nino territory, and then in October of 2019, we started creeping up, we, uh, suggesting building pressure, higher pressure in the Pacific, up and up into 2020, up to a peak in January of 2021 at 20, uh, above normal, and now it's been just a long, steady decline down to normal in April 2021. We're sort of just bouncing around here, but we know that the active phase of the MJO is building pretty solidly, or forecast to build pretty solidly over the next month in the West Pacific. The expectation, and that, that would eventually push over to Haiti. So this index should probably drop much more over the next coming weeks, and that would certainly signal the demise of La Nina. And so that brings us to the official El Nino forecast, sea surface temperature forecast for the Nino 3.4 region uh, uh, from the CFS model. So today, temperatures a little bit below normal, we'll say two-tenths of a degree below normal. According to this model, which has been the doom and gloom model, just suggesting horrible La Nina continuing into all of this year, all of a sudden it's saying, oh no, wait a minute, I've changed my mind. By June, we should be dead neutral temperatures. And then even as we get into the fall, yeah, temperatures back off, but what, maybe three tenths of a degree below normal and holding as we get into January, effective, I mean, into uh, December, that's effectively neutral. Maybe not warm, but not cold either. And this model has been steadily kind of inching up every week a little bit more. So it would not be surprising to see out here this creeping up a little bit more. So for right now, we have a little southern hemi swell in the water, a little smaller forecast even beyond that, um, and perhaps a little bit of North Pacific swell for California, nothing great. And of course, northeast, we'll call it wind swell for the Hawaiian Islands. So there is surf. And then after all that, there's always wind swell. Uh, unfortunately, the temperatures are so cold in Northern California. I don't know how much you really want to surf that wind swell, certainly at the exposed breaks, but do what you got to do. When there's waves, you go, right? Okay, longer term though, Kelvin wave in flight and poised to impact Ecuador, we'll say in the next month. But what's even more interesting is another Kelvin wave associated with a building active phase of the MJO is forecast over the next month, so that we could possibly get two Kelvin waves out of that, and maybe another active phase, oh, you know, two months out, three months out from that, so maybe a third. Will that get us to El Nino? Yeah, probably not. None of the models are saying El Nino. All, the, you know, there's like 30 different uh, long-term El Nino models. They're all saying just to return to normal conditions. That's okay. We'll take that. That's way better than where we are right now. And so right now we're in El Nino, I mean La Nina mode. It'll take, you know, probably another two two to three months for surface temperatures to kind of get back to normal. So that'll get us May, June, maybe early July. And then another three plus months after that for the atmosphere above the ocean to sort of go, hey, something's changed and it returned to normal. So that'll get us into the oh, July, August, September, probably more like October time frame when right as we start the fall time, you know, the fall season change, everything might be back to normal and we could eke out a normal winter moving forward from there. 
Of course, that's all rampant speculation this early date, way too early to know. We don't believe a model three days out, much less three months or six months out. But we're trying to sort of sort through the tea leaves and get a sense of where we're going. The uh, warm phase of the PDO is in effect, so it would not be surprising to see that this La Nina was not particularly long-lasting. And if, in fact, the warm phase of the PDO is in effect, then everything's biased for the Pacific to be kind of warm. And that's where you want to be in terms of uh, Im for improvements in precipitation on California and improvements for surf long-term. All right, if you enjoyed the video, Give us a thumbs up. We'd appreciate it. Subscribe if you haven't. If you don't want to subscribe, that's okay. We post links to this video at the top of every page of the website, stormsurf.com. Go there. All the info that you saw this evening is presented there, buried in the pages. We are still working through the upgrade of the uh, Wave Watch Wave model to the GFS model. The buoy forecasts are down, but we are working on that. And we maybe have some new tools that will pop up along the way. So thank you for your patience. We're working on it. Uh, some of you have sent emails, and we appreciate it. And uh, you are not forgotten. <laughs> we are there. Also, if you'd like to comment, give us a comment. Give us a thumbs up on the, the bull on uh, YouTube. Or um, uh, send comments, questions. We'll reply to them. We'll do our best to reply. Uh, assuming there's not surf or we're not down in the hole trying to do software development to get things up and running for you. But, all right, and thank you for watching. We will do this again next week. Same time, same channel. Be safe, and we'll see you then.